read the whole section. Yeah, don't cherry pick a verse out of context and create terrible theology. We like to do that, don't we? Sometimes we'll read the Old Testament, we'll read a promise that was given to somebody and we'd be like, that's ours. And But you're like, it was promised to Jews in exile in Babylon. And you're like, yeah, but that's my promise. And I'm like, okay, you know, that's what you say. But context, right? And the thing that you have to remember anytime you're reading a verse, anytime you're reading any scripture, is how does this properly interpreted through the lens of the cross. You know, the cross is the high point of scripture. That the, the crucifixion, the resurrection of Jesus, that is the high point, that is the pinnacle, that is the purpose of the whole story. And so any verse that you ever read, if the conclusion that you draw, if the theology that you come up with in any way conflicts or diminishes the power of the cross, the power of the gospel, then there's a misinterpretation in play. There's a problem. And so everything should always be looked at in terms of that lens. You know, that's the first question if I'm struggling with a verse, Old Testament, New Testament, wherever. You know, the first question I'll ask myself is, how does this verse help me better understand the cross of Christ? And from there, a lot of times the Holy Spirit will help me start to unpack it in a way that makes sense. Because if you're not unpacking it from that lens, you're inherently going to draw theology that is not correct. Because that's the overriding, number one, indisputable, sole, controlling rule is the cross. There's no buts. So why do you think both James and Paul use Abraham as an example? Everybody loves to use Abraham, right? He's like your absolute number one Old Testament reference when you read through the New Testament. Like if you're going to read no Old Testament scripture at all, like if you're just like, I'm a New Testament Christian, which is terrible. (laughs) Um, But I've, you know, I get it. There are, that's a thing. Um, So if that's going to be you, at least do yourself the service of reading Abraham's life in Genesis because he's going to come up a lot. You do even better to read the story of Moses too because he's going to come up a whole lot. Like if you get those two down, then, you know, then maybe the Lord will start telling you, hey, I didn't like, I didn't take a chopping ax to the first two thirds of the thing. Like, but, you know, start there. But why do you think they both talk about Abraham? What, what's going on here? And how do they both use Abraham to, on the surface, when you're reading these verses, they use the same guy to draw opposite conclusions. It appears on the surface, right? That's our problem, is that we got one that says, hey, you got to have some works. You got another one that says it's faith only, and they're both pointing to the same dude to go, this is why that's true. Interesting. So why are they both using Abraham? What's going on here? He was the father of their faith, so everybody would have known him. He's the founding father. He's the guy. You know, if you're talking about American history and you leave out George Washington, it's tough. <laughs> you know, it's a tough situation. You know, there's a big void there. You know, if you're talking about any kind of modern somewhat, you know, you leave out Lincoln, it's kind of like leaving out Moses. Mm-hmm. You know, you've kind of like, oh, there's been a big change here, big addition. What's going on? So, yeah, Abraham's the father. Why else is Abraham being used by these two guys, do you think? Had a long life. A lot was reported about that life. A lot of that which was reported was moments of faith. So there's a lot to pull from. Yeah, there's a lot of material there. And there's a lot of, and that's... The thing about Abraham is that Abraham is a life demonstrated in faith. And faith produces true faith, real faith, genuine faith. Not the 
I believe and then I go and do everything the same kind of faith that, you know, we've all seen in our lives. We've probably seen some YouTube videos that are hilarious that also demonstrate that. There's one that just popped into my head as I was saying it, um, but not relevant to the conversation. Um, (laughs) But his faith produces on balance a tremendous amount of action. Sometimes he does the wrong thing. I mean, twice he tells his wife to be like, hey, tell him you're my sister so that they don't kill me, which is like just really bad. I mean, that's terrible, you know? And he practically marries her off to Pharaoh in one of these stories. I mean, just like, whoa. So not a perfect life, which is good for us that this is the guy that's the father of the faith and he's the hallmark and he's handed his wife off twice. That's great for me because it lets me know that there's some major mistakes you can make and it's okay that Lord will still love you. But his faith produced action. And that's what James is talking about. True faith, real faith, obedient faith. If you actually trust God, that's the thing, is you say that you trust Jesus or if you trust Jesus... If he's your savior and you trust him so much that you are surrendering to him, then how can you not obey? And so if there's no fruit, if there is no production, then the question must be asked, was there faith? Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And this was a, they talk about Luther briefly in here. But this was the dividing line that in some ways was a major fault line in triggering the Reformation. You know, there were two major issues in the Reformation if you read Martin Luther's 95 Theses. And one of them was this thing called indulgences, which is the idea that you can buy your way into heaven. This idea that, hey, I've been bad, I can write a check, give it to the church, Pope's going to forgive me, life is good. And Luther refers to it as, I don't know if I wrote that one down, I did not. But he refers to the idea of as soon as the coin's clanging in the collection chest, the soul is freed from purgatory. But the truth is, is that those that pass over the poor to give money to the church in an indulgence are really buying the wrath of God is what Luther says, which was incredibly inflammatory. So you have this idea of corruption that is systemic in the church. And then the other big breakdown is this works-based faith. That's the other huge breakdown that causes the Reformation. And there's a couple of, there's three out of the 95, there's three of them that jump out at me that I kind of wanted you to be aware of because he references Luther and it's important to kind of understand the context of what he's talking about. The number one thing Luther says is that the whole life of believers should be penitence. I'm so grateful to Jesus that my sin convicts me so that I'm penitent and I am continually seeking his forgiveness and seeking to be obedient unto him. That should therefore produce, number three, he goes on and says, but it does not, however, refer solely to inward penitence. If all I say inside is I'm sorry, Nay, such inward penitence is not. It's worthless unless it outwardly produces various mortifications of the flesh, which essentially means are you putting the death to the flesh? You know, Paul says in Galatians 2, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. I've been crucified with Christ. Luther is saying that this penitence must produce the outward effect of putting your innate fleshly desires to death. You cannot continue to do the same things you did. And he goes on to say that the true treasure of the church, it's not the pulp, it's not the indulgences, it's not the the procedures, it's not the Sistine Chapel that was being built at the same time on the backs of the poor who were starving in Europe. True true story. (laughs) It was a massive famine and they were building the basilica. And it's beautiful, and it's great, but, you know, Christ, you know, the another reason why you should read the whole book is that 
the Lord says that those that close their ears to the poor, he will not hear you in your day of distress. It's a timely reminder when we talk about what are our obligations. And Ruther goes on to say the true treasure of the church is the holy gospel of the glory and grace of God. That's the true treasure is the grace of God, faith. And so he says this isn't a works deal. This is a faith deal. And that faith should produce, as John says, but as many as received him, to them he gave the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So when you believe, that faith will produce in you the power of the Holy Spirit. And Acts, it says that you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. It's that power of the Holy Spirit through true faith that will generate the action. The action is a production of faith. It does not generate faith. It's like a math equation. You can't get the A and the B out of order, otherwise the X comes and in, turns into a Y, or, you know, those terrible algebra memories. Um, so how is it that James and Paul actually complement each other in light of kind of what we've been, what I've just been rambling about? Right, they're really not, when you start to think about the big picture, are they contradictory or are they actually saying the same thing? They're saying the same thing. Yeah, there's no contradiction. There's only a contradiction when you cherry pick. There's only a contradiction when you take verses out of context. But as soon as you look at the sum of both of them, what you understand is that a rich faith produces rich works. And that the ultimate manifestation of a rich faith, the ultimate example of we, that we have of a rich faith is Christ, who came and had such a perfect, rich manifestation of faith that he was willing to trust God the Father. He was willing to be obedient to God the Father unto the point of death, the ultimate act of faith the full manifestation of works produced pure righteousness. All right, so Galatians 3, the big idea that you should take away from chapter 3 is that those that believe in Jesus Christ share fully in the blessings God promised to Abraham. The true descendants of Abraham are those that believe in Jesus Christ. That's the big idea of chapter 3. A lot of technical stuff to get there because he's writing this to a group of Jewish believers that are really torn. And that's what's going on, is that he's got inside the church at Galatia all of these Jewish converts and Gentile converts. It's a really mixed, really unique, diverse church, which is great. Diverse churches tend to be super strong and super amazing. They're way cooler to go to than churches that are really sort of just monotonous and very, you know, small and heterogene homogeneous. But with that heterogeneous, with that diversity, can sometimes comes a range of beliefs, a range of ideas, and conflict that has to be resolved which forces us to put to death ourself and our selfishness and manifest a more Christ-like attitude towards others, hence the wonder of diversity. It forces us to act more Christ-like. And so in the balance, Paul talks about faith. He uses the word faith 14 times in 13 verses. You would think that that's actually the number one word in the chapter, because it's the subject of the chapter. But he actually uses the word law 15 times, one more time than he uses faith. The idea here is that these are the two great pillars, if you were, that are being debated in the church. We've got a whole group of, hey, it's faith, that's it, Jesus and faith. And then you've got these Jewish believers are going, what about the law? Jesus said nothing's going to pass away until heaven and earth pass away. We got the law. And so... 
God is a God of moderation. Anytime your theology gets really far into one extreme or the other, you've done something wrong. He's all about balance. So much so that Solomon in Ecclesiastes actually says, don't be too righteous. There's a Bible verse to memorize for you. (laughs) You're like, what? Yeah. Yeah, that's a good memory verse. Don't be too legalistic. And so he here has got these two pillars. And he's trying to help them understand how does the law, how does that fit into faith? How does faith fit into the law? How do they actually build, complement, and strengthen each other? And that's what's going on in this discussion is how does the covenant of Abraham, faith, line up with the covenant of Moses, law? That's what you got. You got the covenant of Moses, which comes after the covenant of Abraham. How do they complement each other? How do they work together? How do they actually produce one beautiful, perfect faith? So, um, who would like to read verses 1, 2, and 5? Can't read them all. There's too many. Okay, 1, 2, and 5. portrayed as crucified. I only want to learn this from you. Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law, or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish? Wait, what were you? One, two, and five. Okay. So then, does God give you the Spirit and work miracles among you by your doing the works of the law, or is it by believing what you heard? By believing what you heard. And heard in that translation is faith in the other translation. Hearing produces faith. In case yours is a little different. Um, And then who would like to read 6 and 9? Okay. Uh, In the same way, Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith. So all who put their faith in Christ share the same blessing Abraham received because of his faith. Okay. So how was Abraham made right with God? He believed. Believed. In faith, right? Isn't that what Paul's saying here? And then he's opening up the chapter with who has bewitched you, who has put you under a spell. Who has told you that faith is insufficient, that you have to go back to the law? He's like, what's going on here? And then he hearkens back to Abraham as his example, as his evidence to these Jewish believers who are quoting the law, chapter and verse and going, but your father, your originator, was a faith guy. Who's told you different? So, as you're reading chapter 3, if you're doing a deep dive at home and you're like, okay, I could really use a commentary on it, and you don't want to buy one, that's great. Because the best commentary on Galatians 3 is actually already in your Bible. (laughs) And it's Romans chapter 4. They go hand in hand. Any study of Galatians 3 has to be done with Romans 4. They talk about the same thing. They go over the same topic. They complement each other. They both reference Abraham. It's the two times that Paul references Abraham in all of his epistles. One is in Romans 4. One of them is in Galatians 3. And then the other one we read about tonight was James. Those are your three mentions of this verse Actually, Hebrews, too, in some sort of, not quite, but yes. Um, And then, of course, Genesis 15 is where this whole thing is extracted from. So, in Romans 4, Paul says, The promise to Abraham or to his descendants that he would be an heir of the world was not through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. So Paul starts off with going, hey, 
It's not the law that was what made the promise, that God made the promise through. God made the promise through faith. Abraham listened to the promise. Abraham trusted the promise. Thus, Abraham obeyed the promise. He obeyed God. Faith produced the action all the way up to the point that he was willing to sacrifice Isaac, believing that since the promise was going to come through Isaac, surely God could raise him from the dead. His faith in God was so complete that we see the Old Testament picture of the cross. I will sacrifice my son in obedience to what needs to be done, knowing that he can be raised. It's your Old Testament picture of the cross of Calvary. He's going to go on in, who wants to read 11, 13, and 14? Okay. Yes, 11, 13, and 14. Um, 11, 13, and 14. Skip 12. Okay, so here Paul is saying that those that rely on the law are under a curse. He's going one step further than just faith is your salvation. He's going one step further as he talks about the law to go, in fact, if you're relying on the law, Not only are you not getting the salvation promised of God, but you're actually under a curse. That you cannot be justified by means of the law. Makes sense, right? We can't earn it. Isaiah, no one is good, no one is righteous, we've all gone astray. So, In the church at this moment in Galatians and in Romans, what you've really got going on is this argument that which one's better than the other, right? You got these faith people, you got these law people, they're both saying their way is better. You probably got a few peacemakers in the middle going, well, either way is okay as long as you're getting to God, right? I mean, that had to be going on. It just seems reasonable that there'd be somebody out there trying to split the difference, Right. I mean, you know, because it's the natural, logical conclusion. If you got this group and this group, there's got to be some people in the middle going, well, either one's got to be okay, right? Can't we just get along? Right. Can't we just? It's human nature. <laughs> Blessed are the peacemakers. I'm here to make peace. Which doesn't work if it's bad theology. <laughs> so, are law and faith equal? Are they complementary? Are they reasonably equal ways to God? Can you can you receive redemption either way? I mean, is one as good as the other? No, yes. Hmm? You need both? Okay. But w- which is the one that generates the righteousness? Could be a trick question. <laughs> Both, kind of. Right. That's the idea. Yeah. Law is there to convict. That's what it's for. It's for you to go, whoa, I need a mediator. I need a savior. I need a way forward. But it's not the way forward. It's just the realization that you need a way forward. 
It's not your bridge, it's your warning sign that the bridge is washed out. Now what do I do? And so if you say the law is sufficient, if you say I can get to heaven by the law, what you're really doing is nullifying the sacrifice of Christ. What you're doing is saying it wasn't necessary, I can do it on my own, in which case God put his son to death for no purpose. That would be a terrible, and then you're telling me I'm worshiping a God that kills his son because he doesn't need to? I don't want to worship a God that just kills his son for sport. Well, hey, here's an alternative way. I got gotcha. you. Don't worry. We've got a plan B. We'll kill him. What? It's awful. Only Christ can redeem us. And that's why he became the curse. It's interesting that the Jew, Jewish leaders go to, go to Pilate saying, we can't put anybody to death. We need you. But the truth is that that's not true, is it? Because earlier in the New Testament, we see that they pick up rocks to stone Jesus, but it wasn't his time. And then we see that they were ready to stone an adulteress until Jesus steps up and goes, oh, wait a minute, who of you don't have sin? They absolutely had the authority to execute people. What they did not have the authority to do was crucify somebody, to kill them on a tree. And they wanted to so convincingly tell the story that he was not the Messiah, that it wasn't enough for them to kill him. They wanted him to die on a tree because it says in Deuteronomy that anyone who dies on a tree is cursed. How could Messiah be cursed? It was their way of manufacturing evidence that he could not be Messiah. So they wanted him dead on a tree. But Paul, through the revelation of the Holy Spirit, realizes that that was actually the plan of God because how could he become the perfect salvation unless he became the complete curse? And so he becomes the curse so that the curse can be lifted from you. He even quotes Habakkuk 2.4, which is a big verse in here, in 11, the one I had you skip, or no, read first. So he says, no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. The righteous man shall live by faith is Habakkuk 2.4. And that's important here because he's linking back to 2.20 and 21, which is really the high point of the whole book, which is that I've been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. So if he's going to be righteous, he has to live by faith. And when he lives by faith, what that means is he's put the flesh to death. It's not him who's living. It's Christ who's living in him. And if Christ is living in him, then that action is going to be righteousness. It's going to produce fruit that's good. Because Christ can only produce good fruit. Your fruit's bad. But if it's Christ living in you, then the fruit is good. So you have to put yourself to death so that Christ can live and shine. Because the righteous man lives by faith. I think we talked about this briefly already. The true purpose of the law. I think Andrew gave it to us already. I didn't know. You know, it's my fault. I asked it in the wrong. Yeah. I did. So we know the true purpose is to draw us, right? Let us know that we're sinful. That's the idea of the law. Is to let us know how bad we are. Romans 14. For if those who are of the law are heirs, faith is made void, and the promise is nullified. For the law brings about wrath, but where there is no law, there also is no violation. Law brings wrath, but we need law. We need law so that we establish violation. How would I know that I'm coveting, Paul uses as the example, 
unless someone told me it's wrong to covet. And we all covet. It's the most base sin there is. Pride, coveting. The fruit looked good. Oh, can I pose a question and have a little bit of fun? Yeah. Alright. When the Ten Commandments are given to us, do you think that is primarily for us as fallen human humanity to see how we fall short of the glory of God? Or do you think it is also or primarily God revealing his to this people. Uh, which one would you say is more than and, and why, if you have kind of a stance on it? I think that ultimately the law is the manifestation of the character of God. And that when we understand the character of God, we understand like Isaiah in the throne room, standing before the holy perfection of God as he sees them going, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. He goes, woe is me, for I am undone. I am an unclean man of unclean lips. And the inevitable consequence of understanding the character of God is an understanding of our inadequacy to ever reach to God. In fact, it's the very idea that Job tackles in the oldest book in the Bible when he says, For he is not a man as I am, that I may answer him, that we may go to court together and argue, There is no umpire between us. Who may lay his hand upon us both? Once I understand the character and the nature of God, I realize that there is no way for me to go to court and argue my case before. I am wholly without a way and a means forward. Where is the umpire? It's amazing. Before the law, before Abraham, before the story of Genesis... Here is Job going, I need a Redeemer. Which is where the song, I Know My Redeemer Lives. It's amazing that that song comes out of Job. It says, as for me, I know that my Redeemer lives, and at last he will take his stand on the earth. The law of Moses reveals the character of God. It reveals the nature of God. But it's that nature that makes us realize we can't do it. That we need a manifestation, right? And the law is so much deeper than just the Ten Commandments is almost like really a table of contents, if you will. Because you, know, you got 672? I think that's the number. I should know that by now as long as I've been reading Talmud. So many sub-laws now, though. Just got my 18th volume in the mail today. Out of 36. I'm halfway through. Three years. It takes seven years if you read a couple pages a day. And by a couple pages a day, I mean at least 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah, you can read the Bible in a year. The Talmud, you need seven if you're following the same schedule. Yeah. Great stories, though. Great examples. Absurd examples. I love the examples. I love the examples in Talmud. My favorite so far was when I was reading about Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And there was a whole discussion about they needed an emergency backup wife for the high priest. Because it says that you have to make atonement for your family and for the nation. You make it for yourself, your family, the nation. So there became a discussion, well, if his wife dies during the sequestration period where he is preparing himself to offer up the sacrifice, he has no family. 
So if he has no family, how can he make atonement for his family? If he can't make atonement for his family, how is he then going to proceed to make atonement for the nation? There's a problem. Now, the natural solution is not to go, well, we need a different priest. That would make sense, right? <laughs> right, you know. If, if, if the wives were in charge, that probably would have been, well, then we need to pick a different one. But the dudes go, well, what we need is an acceptable backup wife. So what they would, and I don't even know how that, pro, how would that go? Like, how do you go home after your sequestration period to your wife and explain who you picked out as your backup wife? <laughs> Feels like a really strange, like, how does that conversation go? But they would pick somebody that would be a suitable wife should his wife die. They could get him married during that period before he offered the sacrifice, and that way he would have a family to atone for. Yeah. Tell me. <laughs> yeah. Which, when you think about that, like, that is so law and not faith. Like, mm-hmm. faith would be like, I'm going to do it anyways. Like, or, yeah, we're just going to pray that the Lord keeps my family from saying during this time. Whereas the law is like, I'm prepared just in, in case this scenario happens or that scenario. Exactly. There is zero faith in Talmud. It is absolutely, if you want to understand the furthest manifestation possible of the law, if you want to understand why Jesus was so upset with the rabbis and the Pharisees, I mean, like, every time he talks to the Pharisees, you get the impression that he's, like, he's pissed. (laughs) You know, like, he's really upset. Like, you're, you know, like, you brood of vipers, and you're like, where's all this hostility coming from? Okay, well, by that time, the Talmud was pretty codified, all right? And that's what they were relying on. Like the whole pick up your mat and walk, that's really not an Old Testament violation, but it is a Talmud violation. That's why he was upset, because he'd been reading about the emergency backup wife. and He'd been going, what have you people been doing? (laughs) I don't send you a prophet for 400 years and this is what happens? What is going on? He's upset. So the law was never meant to produce that. It was meant to produce faith. So last, who are the real heirs of the promise? Who wants to read sixteen, eighteen? Actually, we'll skip. Well, no. Who wants to read 16, 18, and 16, 18, 24, and 29? I will. All right. 16, 18. 24, 29. I had to cut some out. We're running behind. All right. Verse 16. Now the promises were made to Abraham and to his offspring. It does not say into offspring. If the inheritance comes by the law, it no longer comes by promise, but God gave it to Abraham by a promise. Uh, 24? 24 and 29. Uh, 23 and 29. 23 and 29. Verse 23. Now before faith came, we were held captive under the law, imprisoned until the coming faith would be revealed. Yeah, you were right. It was 24. Sorry. <laughs> so then the law was our guardian until Christ came in order that we might be justified by the faith. Verse 29. And if you are Christ, then you are Abraham's offspring, heirs according to the promise. So who are the real heirs of the promise? How do you think the Jewish believers of the church who for a thousand years have felt superior because, or more really, probably at this point, 1,500 years, have felt superior because they claim Abraham as their father, as in literally I'm a descendant of Abraham. There's a point of pride for them, right? They didn't take it well, right? Probably cringed. Yeah. Like, especially if they were like, oh, 
especially when like people would say, remember when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. That was, that was really cool. And they would both like, yeah. That probably made them very uncomfortable. Yeah, it's a little cringe. I cringe a little when I read it. I have to tell you, you know, like, because I'm half Jewish and like I'm I'm really happy to be a descendant of Abraham. You know, like that makes me makes me feel good. Like when I'm my fleshly instincts are reigning. Like you know, it's a little bit of feeling good in that. Like you know, maybe the Lord is going to choose to use me to bless the earth because I'm a descendant of Abraham. You know, just there's a little bit of superiority there. The Nobel Prize count. It's a big deal. <laughs> Did you know that a quarter of all Nobel Prizes in science and mathematics have been awarded to Jewish people? The Lord blessing the earth through the descendants of Abraham. Not that they're better or smarter. He just uses them to bless. And by you, all people will be blessed. It's impressive for 0.1% of the earth's population. Nuclear energy, yes. <laughs> Nagasaki, not so much, yeah. but you know. Like anything else, good and bad. So Abraham was told he'd be the father of many nations. But the inclusivity of the gospel for all who would receive was made known in the beginning. God has always been the God of those who believe him, not just the nation of Israel. You know, the nation of Israel was always like, well, no, you got to do this and this and convert and this. But God has always been the God to those who call upon him. Remember Ruth, the Moabite? She says, I will go and your God will be my God and your people will be my people. She claims God and its righteousness. Rahab. Rahab's a prostitute in a town that the Lord's about to strike down. And she says, I know that your God is God. And she has faith. He's always been there. Paul writes in Romans 4, For this reason it is by faith, in order that it may be in accordance with grace, so that the promise will be guaranteed to all the descendants, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who are of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written, a father of many nations, I have made you. In the presence of him whom he believed, even God, who gives life to the dead and calls into being that which does not exist. It's our God. He calls into being that which does not exist. It's an awesome God. But notice that Paul uses the same verse in here that he does in Galatians 3 that we just read many nations all right application plan 